I've tried like four times to get this camera angle right. So we're just gonna go with this. And if it starts to sag, then it starts to sag, all right? And we're just gonna all deal with it together. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to the bookcase, or more accurately, uh, welcome to the floor in front of my bookcase. Uh, I'm down here on the floor because I wanted to film a little bit different of a video for you guys today. I wanted to show you my library book sale haul. So a library book sale, for those of you who don't know, is when a library is getting rid of extra books in its inventory, books that they are taking out of circulation that are too damaged or used to be in circulation anymore, or books that were donated to them that they, for whatever reason, do not want to put in circulation. All the funds from the sale go to support the library, and the books, because there are a lot of them, are really really cheap you can get pretty good finds if you know what you're looking for for pennies on the dollar so my library had its book sale last week and i went on the very first day because i wanted to get any of the good stuff uh, and i definitely found some good stuff so i got 16 volumes at the book sale and i say volumes and not books because two of them are actually collections of books or short stories so i feel like it's a little inaccurate to say i got 16 books because i really got more like 20 books and an extra 10 to 15 short stories on top of that so i got 16 volumes um, but everything that i got was under ten dollars and that's not under ten dollars per book the whole haul cost less than ten dollars so if you've never been to a library book sale and you like to buy and have books I highly recommend it. You can find pretty good stuff for a pretty good price and you can support a good local cause. So the very first table that caught my eye when I went into the book sale was this table that had lots of hardcover volumes that were in really nice condition and they were a little bit more expensive, uh, but I was immediately drawn to two. The first one being this beautiful collection of Mark Twain's works. and. It obviously attracted me at first because look at it, it's gorgeous, it's very, very pretty. But also, I was just talking to Steven earlier in the week about how one of the things I wanted to do on this channel was read more classics. There are a lot of classics that I either have not read or have not read in a very, very long time. And Mark Twain was one of the authors I wanted to read. So I was really excited to find this. So this, has, as you can kind of see there, maybe if the glare isn't too bad, kind of. It's got The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain's Sketches, Mark Twain's Burlesque Autobiography, I hope I pronounced that right, The Prince and the Pauper, and A Connecticut in King Yankee's Court. So I've read Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn before, um, but I have not read the rest, and I haven't read Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn since I was in elementary school. So I'm really eager to read some of these and it's going to just look beautiful on my shelf. The second book that I got at the same table was David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens is another classic author who I wish I have read more of. I have read A Christmas Carol so many times. I love it. I think it's brilliant. It's so well written. The message is so good. I've never seen a film adaptation that I didn't like, um, but I've never read any of his longer novels and I was really excited to find this. Again, it is gorgeous, so it will look beautiful up on the shelf. And David Copperfield is something that I've never read, so I was really eager to find this as well. This is the Reader's Digest edition. So it's really sturdy and it came with a nice little insert about the story and about the author. Um, so I'm eager to get started on that. And I gotta tell you, I did not know that David Copperfield was so long. I knew Dickens wrote long books, but this, this is 747 pages and the pages are packed with really tiny print. Like you look at something like, like here, a little spoiler for later. You look at something like this and these pages, maybe you can't tell on camera, but these, the print is not as small on these pages. And 
there's fewer of them. Like you look at the thickness of these two books together and this one only looks a little bit longer, but this is 300 pages longer than this one and the print is smaller. So I'm a fast reader, but I don't know how long it will take me to read this. So if you're expecting a video on David Copperfield, <laughs> David, if you're expecting a video on David Copperfield soon, maybe don't hold your breath. Speaking of Charles Dickens, the next book that I got is also a classic, Great Expectations. This one obviously is not as pristine as some of the others. I think it's probably from a school. It seems to have that kind of vibe to it. It is definitely a older, much loved volume. But again, Great Expectations, book I have not read that I'm really excited to read. Um, this is a lot shorter than David Copperfield. I'll probably start my Dickens journey with this one just because one, it's kind of the most famous and two, I do want to still have a life. <laughs> and I think if I start reading David Copperfield, uh, I won't have a life until it's finished. So great expectations. I have great expectations for this one. Let's just keep doing classics. We're on a roll with the classics I found some John Steinbeck. I found Of Mice and Men. I found The Red Pony and The Grapes of Wrath. So John Steinbeck is an author. Um, I have read John Steinbeck before. I had to read The Pearl in seventh grade, which Wow, The Pearl is a downer to read in seventh grade. Uh, I did really enjoy it. I enjoyed his writing, but it's very depressing. And from what I know about John Steinbeck, uh, these aren't going to be much better on that front. Um, so I might have to wrap myself up with a blanket and a cup of cocoa uh, to get through these. But these are, again, these are all classics and I think they're classics for a reason. I specifically, I wanted to get Of Mice and Men because uh, it's pretty short and I know a lot of schools do teach this in English class, but my school never did. So I wanted to give that one a go. Grapes of Wrath, again, classic. I specifically got The Red Pony because in Matilda by Road Doll, which I have up here somewhere, here it is. In Matilda, uh, in Matilda by Road Doll, um, the book that she is reading when her dad starts harping on her about reading all the time is The Red Pony. It's the book she's reading when he kind of goes off about how reading doesn't matter and how the only thing that matters is knowing how to make money. Um, and that always stuck in my head, that scene where she's trying to connect with her, her dad and say, no, it's really good. It's a lovely book it's about, and he just doesn't want to hear it. Um, but I've never read it, so I'm going to get in touch with my inner Matilda and give this one a go. Again, like Nice and Men, this one's pretty short. I'm a fast reader. I could probably knock this out in less than an afternoon. I could probably knock out both of these in an afternoon um, with time for Netflix to spare. The last classic that I picked up is The Scarlet Letter. Everything that was kind of on this table uh, where all of these classic paperbacks came from, I think they are from schools uh, because they do remind me of the types of paperbacks that you get in your English class when it's like, okay, we're all gonna read, uh, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird and they give you a paperback that's like this and they tell you to read two chapters of it and all I wanted to do was read the whole thing in one sitting, but no, we had to only read two chapters so we could have our discussion. I think these are from a school, is what I'm saying. Uh, the Scarlet Letter, uh, again, is a classic that I have never read, so I wanted to pick it up uh, to expand my collection of classics and uh, kind of expand that knowledge. I think I'm, I'm kind of uh, toying with the idea of doing a series uh, on classics that I've never read and examining them and seeing uh, why they're classic and if they should still be classic. So those are my classics. Moving in a completely different direction, I found two Star Trek books. <laughs> um, so fun fact about me, I love Star Trek. 
Star Trek Next Generation is one of my favorite TV shows. Right here, actually, behind me, this is my Starfleet Ships Encyclopedia, my illustrated encyclopedia of all of the ships in Starfleet, starting with uh, the year 2294 in the show, which is around when Next Generation, it's a few years before Next Generation starts. Um, and then going up all the way through uh, Discovery and beyond. Some of the things uh, in the end of the book are from the time skip that takes place in Discovery. Um, uh, point is, I love Star Trek. I love Star Trek a lot. On the science fiction table, when I saw a Next Generation novel and a original series novel. Uh, I couldn't resist picking them up. Uh, there were also, there were two novels uh, in a series called, I think, Starfleet Academy, that's about like Kirk and Spock and Bones in Starfleet Academy. Um, I didn't get those just because, again, my heart kind of lies with Next Generation more than the original series. So this is one that I'm more excited to read. And this is one that just, even if I read it and I don't really care for it, it's just so, I love the cover design on this. I love the colors. It's just very pretty. And I like, I like when books can be both a source of like entertainment and knowledge, but then also decoration. I like displaying books in a way that uh, is interesting and that makes me happy. And so even if I don't end up loving this book, I am going to love displaying this book. So very excited about these. Keeping the sci-fi train rolling, we found a volume of Hugo winners. And this is something that Steven actually decided to pick up, but I'm probably going to read it too because I do really like sci-fi. I just, I have not read as much sci-fi as I have watched. Um, so I'm excited to give this a shot. This is volume three of the Hugo winners. It's 15 prize-winning science fiction stories. And then it lists out the authors here. So we've got, I'm probably going to mispronounce all of these names. I'm very sorry for that. We've got, R.A. Laferty, Ursula K. Le Guin, Theodore Sturgeon, Fritz Lieber, Frederick Pohl, and C.M. Kornbluth, Larry Neven, George R.R. R. Martin, uh, Pohl Anderson, James Tittree Jr., and Harlan Ellison. So uh, this is the one that I kind of have the least uh, knowledge and experience about, but I am excited to give it a try. And it was on the same table as the Star Trek books. They kind of had everything grouped by genre. So there was a big hardcover table. There was a sci-fi table. There was a classics table. Um, so excited to give this a shot. Speaking of books that Steven picked out, um, we have Casual Rex. I don't know. <laughs> Let me read you the description for Casual Rex. <clears throat> In 1999, Eric Garcia made his mark with one of the most striking mystery debuts of the year, Anonymous Rex. Oh, this is the about the author. <laughs> Vincent Rubio is a private eye, working the angles in Los Angeles with his partner, Ernie. They've got the usual problems, bills, bum cases, woman troubles, but being dinosaurs is not a problem, as long as their latex disguises fit perfectly. <laughs> not all dinosaurs agree. Some have joined a mysterious back to basics movement led by a beautiful and beguiling velociraptor to help dinosaurs find themselves, let their tails hang out and roam about as they really are. When a member of this cult dies under suspicious circumstances, Vincent and Ernie must investigate while simultaneously handing the case of the missing Mussolini, the theft of a rare and priceless prosthetic <laughs> treasured by the dinosaur community. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> oh no. I didn't read that far ahead. Listen, listen. Um, when you see a book called Casual Rex at 
a 25 cent book sale, I think you are morally obligated to pick it up. <laughs> Not necessarily to finish reading it, but at least to try. So, uh, so yeah, we're gonna try. Apparently this isn't even his first dinosaur book. This is a sequel to Anonymous Rex. Which sure, you know what, sure. 1999, why am I not surprised? And now something completely different. The Da Vinci Code. So I found two Dan Brown novels, actually. I found The Da Vinci Code and The Lost Symbol. They are both in really nice shape, which is surprising to me. Um, this seems like the type of book that you would have a hard time finding uh, in nice shape. You always hear really good things about The Da Vinci Code. I have never read The Da Vinci Code. I have read Dan Brown though. I, I don't remember the name of the Dan Brown book that I read, but I have read a Dan Brown book and I enjoyed it. And I've seen The Da Vinci Code movie and enjoyed it. And I know that there are a lot of differences between the book and the movie, or at least I believe that to be the case. Um, so I'm excited to see uh, how the book is. And then also we've got just another Dan Brown book, The Lost Symbol. I know pretty much nothing about this one. Uh, I just know that I like Dan Brown's writing. I like a good adventure story uh, and it's probably gonna be good. If it's not, I'll be sure to let you know. Keeping the adventure train rolling right along, I've got a Clive Cussler book. Uh, and even if you've never read a Clive Cussler book, you've probably heard of Clive Cussler or if you've at least seen him in a bookstore or a library. He has written tons and tons of books, not dissimilar to Tom Clancy or James Patterson. Um, he's a little more upfront with his assistant writers, ghost writers, whatever you want to call them, than James Patterson is. Um, but he definitely got to the point where he was writing so many books that he was not the only one writing them anymore. So Corsair is a novel of the Oregon Files. Uh, the Oregon Files is probably my favorite of the Clive Cussler series, certainly the one that I remember the most fondly. So when I was in middle school, high school, uh, my mom would get library books, uh, audiobooks from the library, and we would listen to them in the car on the way to school, on the way to church, on the way to the grocery store. We lived kind of in the middle of nowhere. Everywhere was at least a 10 to 15 minute drive away. So we went through a lot of audiobooks and we went through a lot of Clive Cussler books partially because the stories are really interesting and partially because most modern Clive Cussler books are narrated by Scott Brick, who is a very, very talented audiobook reader. And The Oregon Files, Juan Cabrillo and his crew uh, are my favorite series by Clive Cussler. Here's the thing about Clive Cussler. Um, he writes very engaging adventure style novels. Uh, with a lot of action, with a lot of interesting information about ships, diving, nautical science, military stuff, all type of stuff. Kind of like Tom Clancy, but a little less wordy than Tom Clancy. Um, the price of admission is maybe just a little more nationalism than you're necessarily comfortable with. Uh, certainly looking back on these books as an adult has made me go eh, a little bit more than I did when I was a, you know, unquestioning teenager. Um, I think they're still good. I think as far as nationalist adventure novels go, you can do a lot worse than Clive Cussler. I'll probably do a whole video talking about Clive Cussler, honestly, and just kind of navigating all of that because there's some stuff that's definitely like, playing into stereotypes, playing into a certain audiences' expectations, but at the same time, breaking down a lot of those stereotypes, differentiating very clearly between people and governments and people and institutions. Um, I don't know, Clyde Kessler can be a can of worms, but I remember really liking this one. And when I saw this one there, again, in pretty nice condition, I mean, I'm not gonna turn down a 50 cent hardcover copy of one of my more favored childhood stories. So, 
Another series that my mom listened to on audiobook and that I caught a lot of was the Fox and O'Hare series by Janet Ivanovich. And this is the first book in that series, The Heist. I love heists. Uh, I love heist movies, heist shows, heist novels, anything that has a heist in it. I cannot get my hands on it fast enough. So uh obviously <laughs> this book would be right up my alley i have heard this one before but i'm excited to read it again um kate o'hare is our main character and she is an fbi agent and then uh nick fox our other main character is a con man and she has to catch him but then when she catches him uh-oh they have to work together to solve a case so naturally uh hilarity and maybe a little bit of falling in love and adventure happens after that. Uh, this is a good fun romp as far as I remember um, and I'm excited to dive back into it. Now to complete our nostalgia train and also complete our haul, uh, I couldn't resist picking up this copy of the Boxcar Children that I saw. Um, the Boxcar Children is it's funny, the first Boxcar Children book is not a mystery, uh, and then all of its sequels are. All of its sequels are about the four kids solving crimes and mysteries in various places with their grandfather, and they're kind of known as being a great kids mystery series. I loved them as a kid. I kind of credit uh, things like the Boxcar Children and Nancy Drew uh, for instilling in me at a young age a love of mystery stories. But the first Boxcar Children is not a mystery. Um, but what it is, is it is just every kid who has ever played out in their yard with sticks and mud and played house and played at making like soup out of water and mud and stones that you find and making a house out of sticks and things. It's that it's every, it's that kid's dream is living in the woods in a box car, making a broom out of sticks and, you know, making your dinner out of the root vegetables and herbs and berries that you can find in the forest. And it's just, it's a delightful time. I saw it on the kids table and I couldn't resist. I left the rest of the kids books that were there for the actual children. Um, but I, I couldn't resist uh, picking this up and taking this trip down memory lane. So this was uh, the last thing that I picked up. So that is all of the books that I got at the library book sale. I hope you enjoyed whatever this video was. If you did, there are YouTube buttons that you can click. They do YouTube things. Um, and you probably won't see a video like this on this channel again for some time because I'm not in the habit of buying 15 to 20 books at once. Uh, again, I was able to do that this time because these were all less than $10. Support your local libraries, see if they have a book sale or a way to donate your time, your money, your books, whatever. I'm sure they'd love the help. Um, but in the meantime, my name is Taylor. This has been The Bookcase and go have fun reading something.